and we are live well people already i am so excited you're here um and uh let me tell you about my new guest he was involved as a producer uh uh, on The Phenomenon with uh, director James Fox, of course, which is an epic, epic film. And um, he is the maker of Third Eye Spies, which I was watching today again a little bit. And also that film is just sheer brilliance, entertainment, and I love it. So let me introduce you to my guest, Mr. Lance Merja. Boom. Hello, uh, sir. How are you? Yeah, man, yeah like Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Max, thanks oh. for having me, man. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to have you on, Lance. And by the way, talking about Italy, it's actually kind of where we met. Not really. It was San Marino, but, you know, surrounded by Italy. Uh, Italy is a... I, I actually, you know, I, I, I got the opportunity to go to Italy and I wound up at this conference and I literally had never been there before. It's such a beautiful country, and especially San Marino, man. I mean, it's just blow mind how beautiful that country I is. Had no idea. Really? Yeah, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd never even heard of San Marino until just recently, and and uh, you know, I actually live not far from the city of San Marino in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, it's kind of a suburb of Los Angeles, outside of Los Angeles, and and uh, I never knew that that was actually a real country. <laughs> within Italy, which which I guess is like the, it's the oldest continuous republic that that never fell even after the Roman Empire. You know, it's like it's been since the days of the Roman Empire. The, this place always remained a republic uh, because it was so isolated and and it was so walled off. You know, on top of a mountain, basically, it's just this little enclave, and and so it's I, I believe it's the oldest republic in the world. That, that well, still it's, exists. It's it's like walking in in a fairy tale. It's well, like walking yeah. through history. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. It's like on a on a hill. Uh, it's it's like you you don't even think a place like that can exist. You know, you think that this is only in 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 in, in fairy tales. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but then again, we were there and with Mr. Elizondo. <laughs> sure, and and a lot of the the really the very. Uh, most interesting um, Italian researchers of the, you know, UAP UFO phenomenon, and uh, you know, just some very, very interesting and smart people there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was very excited. Now, Lance, uh, first, before we kick off this uh, San Marino thing, uh, let's talk a little bit about your work. Sure. So may maybe uh, kick this off by, by uh, telling a little bit about yourself, your work, uh, because I just introduced you as someone who was involved with the phenomenon, uh, filmmaker of uh, Third uh, Eye Spies, uh, sure. Six, stri Six String Samurai, your, yes. your uh, breakout uh, mm -hmm. film. Tell yeah, me. I did the, um, you know, I, I started with uh, Six String Samurai, which I did, started originally in film school and then went on and, and uh, got funding from what ultimately became um, part of Lionsgate uh, to uh, finish the film. And, um, and you know, that, that sort of opened a lot of doors for me. I did music videos for a number of years. I had some top 10 videos on, on uh, MTV and VH1. Um, I did. Um, okay. Your favorite go favorite my, video clip. My favorite video. Go. Uh, is yeah. is is uh, one by that I did called uh, I've seen better days by Citizen King. It's an old song now. I still hear it in stores, and I just I really enjoyed the video. It was actually a, it included uh, a, a UFO abduction in the end. It was very uh, satirical. You can still find it on on YouTube, and uh, yeah. you know that's that was my favorite one that I did. But um, you took I, your opportunity. You took your opportunity, uh, yes. didn't you? Yeah, and then um, I also did. Um, um, a sequel to The Crow called The Crow Wicked Prayer, uh, which was a film that that um, I felt was really very, very flawed. You know, it had some really great things about it. The actors were amazing to work with. But, um, you know, that it, it's just a difficult um, thing when you deal with a franchise like that. So so that yeah. that caused me to kind of step back a little bit from filmmaking for a while. And um, during that same period, um, DSLRs were invented. And all of a sudden, you could go shoot high quality HD footage with a yeah. consumer camera, which before that I had always shot on 35 millimeter. So, um, and, I, and I was actually really a film snob. I only shot on 35 millimeter, even my short films, 
in film school, um, you know, I, I, I begged and borrowed to get like free film stock and, uh, you know, Panavision cameras, these like big cinema cameras with great lenses to shoot with. And, um, and then once sort of HD came along and these consumer cameras got better and better, I started to think more and more about documentaries and, and to yeah. think about how can I harness this consumer technology without having to wait for other people to fund my projects. Cause unlike the Netherlands, you know, we don't have any state funding, unfortunately. It's like, it's, it's, it's always been sort of a uh, rich man's well, and rich woman's business. Well, Lance, yeah. let me tell you about the state funding in the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, our yearly budget is about 60 million euros, which mm -hmm. is the equivalent of one low budget Hollywood film. Yeah. And we well, have to do everything with it. I could so, do an uh, awful lot. I could do an awful lot <laughs> if I had all 16 million or even one, you know, it's, like, it's, it's a little yeah. bit, you know, but, but uh, I, I wound up, um, you know, starting to make documentaries and, um, and basically just teaching myself all of the tools that I had never learned as a, you know, mainstream director, you know, cause I'd always been kind of in the background directing other people to do stuff. And once I, uh, started making documentaries, I had to learn how to edit. I had to learn how to, to shoot, you know, I had to learn, um, you know, very specific technical tasks I'd never bothered to learn. So I did that for a while. Um, I made a few documentaries, uh, Third Eye Spies uh, being the main one right now that it, that is out, uh, which you can find worldwide online pretty much everywhere. Um, and uh, that led me to meet James Fox, who right. um, who then brought me on to the phenomenon after he had been working on it for several years. I mean, he had been gathering footage uh, for years before we met. And um, I basically came on uh, later in the project um, and spent about a year on and off working on it. Um, as an editor, I became a co-writer of the project um, because we, you know, we, we restructured it and, and did it. And, uh, and then he also gave me a producer credit on the, on the project. So, um, nice. but uh, that was a fascinating experience because I learned an awful lot about consciousness by doing the documentary on Third Eye Spies, which was about the, uh, remote viewing program that was at SRI, Stanford Research Institute, from the 70s to the 90s, where basically they were using psychics that they had trained from the army and other places to spy on the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had their own psychics uh, trying to spy on the United States. So, so there was this kind of a psychic spy versus spy war going on, which I yeah. found really fascinating. And um, a lot of that stuff had been declassified just recently. So I was able to get interviews with a lot of people who had never been on camera before to talk about this uh, yeah. subject. And uh, it was a fascinating experience. And you can see that even on YouTube right now. It's free on YouTube. Uh, I did. Has, has put it up. So it's. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm going to put it in the in the, in the subscription yeah. anyway. Yeah, please. So, so Lance, be, before we cannot just step over the phenomenon, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when I, when I started the phenomenon, I thought of myself yeah. as sort of a jack of all trades when it comes to you know phenomenon like with the paranormal because i've always been interested in the subject and so i i do a lot of reading on it i had researched it um and i thought i knew what i was thinking and doing but when i watched okay stop it stop it yeah. right there stop <laughs> it right there what were you feeling before you uh started uh, before you were involved with uh, the, the the making of the phenomenon because well I'm i mean i've always i've always felt that that um as a society as a planet we would be very naive to think that we are the only thing that exists in this massive multiverse you know right. that, that we have and and uh, i've always felt that way and um didn't give it a whole lot of, of consideration, but just figured that it was like, sort of like saying the world is flat to say that we were the only thing and the only points of consciousness that can exist in this vast universe. So I've yeah. always felt that way. Um, and I just didn't do, you know, I didn't get into the nitty gritty of it. I, I'm not dogmatic about the way that I think. Um, I, I prefer to be a um, sort of an enlightened skeptic uh, when it comes to the paranormal. Um, you know, I don't like being, uh, bought in and, you know, fully sold on something. I like to be open and, and yes. still discerning. I'm a discerning skeptic really, you know? And, and so, um, I think that's the, what we should all be, you know, we should all be interested in what we don't know, you know, and, and still, uh, 
aware of what we do know so so that yeah. we don't fall into traps because these days with the internet especially it, it's so easy to fall into traps where we go down really just dark rabbit holes uh because i think there's a lot of people out there that try to sell you something and say i know all of the answers well guess what they don't know all of the answers if they knew all of the answers they wouldn't be telling you they know all the answers and and so uh i've come to find that very early on and i think there are exceptions to that in the ufo community and i think one of those exceptions is james you know i think james right. has been very credible for a lot of years making ufo films and he is truly an investigative journalist at heart and the other person that i found that really i feel is above board is lou you know lou, lou elizondo i mean who who long before i met lou you know i've enjoyed his interviews and and the things that he has said because um he is not definitive you know you, you need to be really aware when people are being so definitive and especially if they're being scary and trying to sell you something at the same time exactly it's a con you know it's a con and 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 you, you know i find that there are some very sober minded people working in um the field of uh sort of the paranormal i guess you would call it you know um whether it's in the field of consciousness you know people like dean radin and russell targ and um you know many other recent stephen schwartz and people who who have spent years researching ed may uh you know these guys are phd scientists um yeah and in the ufo community some of those same people have crossed over into the field and a lot of these guys are very very smart you know um that's what i was really impressed with in italy i mean there are people that i had never even heard of in italy that that were have dedicated their lives to very very sober study of of the phenomenon and and uh, are dedicated to kind of not making <clears throat> conclusions but rather just asking a lot of good questions now rewind let's rewind a little bit <laughs> <laughs> So you you told us you were uh, a bit of a skeptic before uh, uh, stepping into the process of making the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now during the process, what happened uh, with you, and how did you look at the phenomenon after? Well, I mean, I don't want to say that I was a skeptic. Uh, you know, a skeptic, skeptic is a very loaded term because a skeptic says, okay, well, I just didn't believe in anything. And, and it, it's kind of like saying, well, I don't believe in lasers. You know, that's, that's not, that can't be a true statement because lasers either exist or they don't exist. You know, I'm either yeah. going to have evidence of a laser being fired and hitting something or it just doesn't exist. And, and so just like with, with consciousness and my journey came out of studying consciousness originally because I spent so long working on Third Eye Spies. And even prior to that, I was very interested in issues of the mind, issues of spirituality, uh, issues of kind of like who we are as human beings and what makes us tick as human beings. So um, as part of that, I had already over many years kind of come to conclusions that we don't know everything about the way that the human mind works. We don't know everything about the way that the universe works. You know, we're fooling ourselves if we think we do. And and that led me to having an open mind with um uh oh um one second. Um oh, the sorry. wife. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um that led me to having an open mind with um UFOs as well. Um and even prior to working with phenomenon, I had been a little bit in that field. I mean, I've kind of like touched several of the players in the UFO field just through my work and through mutual mm -hmm. friends. And, you know, it's actually a fairly small community. Um, so I was already aware of things. But once I watched the phenomenon, I think what what James Fox and uh, the other producers of the phenomenon and the people that had worked on it before me as well did is um, they did a really great job of gathering bulletproof evidence. And, and uh, evidence is not just video. You know, it's not just a piece of metal. It's no. who does it come from? You know, like who is it involved? Does it involve a military pilot that is highly trusted or does it involve an anonymous guy on YouTube or a guy right. trying to sell you a book or, or a DVD? You know, it, it's like those are completely different classes. That's why police officers are so taken so seriously. And you have to weight those things when you're looking at evidence, not just a photo or whatever. And what impressed me about the phenomenon was that literally there was a bevy of evidence that went back 70 more or more years um, with incredibly 
steady testimony from very, very credible people, people like yeah. Harry Reid, people like, um, you know, a radar uh, operator and, and, Pen and Pentagon liaison in 1952 uh, during the UFO flap over Washington, D.C., where we yeah. found like incredibly good archival testimony of, of what occurred and, and in that event and, and other events like it going over and over and over again and the incredible consistency between the events. And, and, and the problem, just like I had with Third Eye Spies when dealing with the phenomenon, is there was so much material and so much evidence that you can get lost in the weeds in it. And, and, uh, and I literally had to sit down and watch hours yeah. and hours and hours of the footage that James had gathered over many years. And, and as a filmmaker, after a while, you just get blinded by so much material and you don't know like where's the best parts to pull. So I was yeah, brought you, in kind of as, a, as a fresh face to kind of look at it. And, yeah. um, and that uh, I can say after about a couple of days of, of uh, working on that film, I had to step away and I just had like a lump in my throat and I was just like, wow, I thought I knew quite a bit but I really didn't know hardly anything, you know? Um, yeah. and, and this was all publicly available stuff that, that James had just very meticulously scrounged from around the world. And, and yet um, the weight of it becomes overwhelming and, and you can no longer sit back and go, well, you know, there's just nothing to this or it's all just, uh, you know, flocks of geese or uh, radar inversions, you know, it's not. Yeah. So one of the most compelling cases uh, in uh, the phenomenon is, of course, the Rua Zimbabwe case. The Rua Zimbabwe uh, case is a case that that literally like affected me emotionally. And um, I remember one of the last times we were locking the film and we were watching it. And um, I was with uh, Jacques Vallée and with James. You know, Jacques uh, Vallée was a consultant on the film. He's he's been around the, the field for since Blue Book. And yeah. um, and. I teared up watching the, the, the Rua Zimbabwe case because, um, again, just like when I worked on Third Eye Spies. Now, hold on, uh, Lance. Uh, for, yes. the, for the people who don't know what we're talking about. Oh, sure. Let's, may, may, let's sure, maybe sure. explain. Okay, so, so Rua yeah. Zimbabwe, um, it, I believe it was like 1996 Four, or something yeah. like that. Um, it was in the 90s. Um, they had several days of sightings of phenomenon in the sky and um ufos yeah ufos um and this was reported all throughout africa and um in zimbabwe in particular and after about three days of these sightings um there were about 200 school kids a uh, grade school kids um on recess in a school in in uh, the aerial school in Rua, zimbabwe who witnessed um a craft actually just land in the middle of their schoolyard, you know, or right yeah. at the edge of the fence of their schoolyard, this circular disc, you know, kind of a half dome. And then these little beams. Yeah, we're talking out. about, we're talking about 60 to hundred kids to a hundred. I think it was who... 200 kids. Yeah, I, I well, believe it was yeah. like 200 kids, you know, and, and uh, I could yeah. be wrong, but I think it was about 200 kids. It was like, you know, and uh, these little beings get out and interact with the kids for about 30 minutes. And yeah, telepathically. And, telepathically um yes um and at the end of the 30 minutes the school bell rings and the little kids all just turn around and run back to class and the right. and the craft takes off and that was it and and this was not a unique occurrence by the way you know nope. based on research that we've done there was another occurrence in well it's also in the film there's westall australia yep. and there's also um there was a case in los angeles in the 70s i think um, that one it, you, you that one you actually told me about. I, I didn't yeah, even know about. Yeah, that yeah. Place. There's there's been there's been a handful of these instances where little kids were interacted with, right? So by the way, thank you, thank you, disclosure team, my buddy Vinny. Uh, a little uh, heads up, uh, we just started our new uh, YouTube channel, Owls of Disclosure. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, also sign up for that. Sorry, Lance, I had to cool. do that. No, nah, cool, good deal. <laughs> disclosure team. Um, and, um, anyway, so, um, the thing that, that, that struck me the most emotionally was James went back and found these school kids, like I think 20 of them, um, 20 years later or more. And, uh, every single one of them stuck to the same story. And, and basically they were all told and shown images in their mind 
um, of the dangers of technology and, right. and the dangers that were being presented to the planet because of our technology kind of run amok and our lack of responsibility for our ecosystem. Exactly. And, and, and what they described that they were shown in their heads literally was sounding to me exactly like what is happening today. Um, it because, is. Because literally, like, as I was watching this footage, we were um, not even in our editing room. We were someplace totally different miles away because there were massive forest fires and, and windstorms in um, Northern California that were knocking out all the power, you know, and, and all of the power had been turned off throughout all of San Francisco and all of Northern California at the time. Um, and these kids were describing what sounded like my daily life at the time. They were, they, they were talking about right. forest burning, uh, drought, you know, huge storms, uh, you know, basically all of the climate issues that we are having today. And this is what yeah. was being conveyed. And, and what you find, and what I also learned through research on the phenomenon um, was that this is a common theme for people who are, are experiencers and who consider themselves experiencers. Uh, John Mack, who was the Harvard professor that went and interviewed these kids, who was uh, very well known in the UFO community um, for doing um, yeah, these uh, regressions and things like that. You know, he was a trained yeah. Harvard psychiatrist. Uh, he commented that very, very often the people that he would work with, it would come down to environmental themes themes about uh, the dangers of destroying the planet, either through nuclear war or through climate change. So yeah. um, so it becomes really a very cautionary tale. If you're going to take it at face value, uh, you know, these kids were all very credible witnesses. It seems so incredible that you almost don't want to look at the case. And in fact, when James was first told about the case, uh, he was actually told about it in a letter through a friend from, believe it or not, Steven Spielberg. You know who who oh, I apparently shit. watched one of James's films, and and then got the word back to him to say, you know, you should really check out Rua Zimbabwe, and and I think James ignored it for years, because it's kind of like one unbelievable thing at a time. You know, first it you have to so it sounds so out there. You 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 have a hard time thinking now. This this cannot be. It, it does, and if it was a, an isolated case, yeah. you would have a really hard time thinking about it. But the other case that really sticks out besides Rua, uh, and and sort of just the incredible testimony that that these kids all gave that was so consistent, and that never changed over decades. You yeah, know. So let's 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 talk about John Mack again because he was the psychiatrist from Harvard who right. interviewed uh, about. He was the head, of the head of the Harvard psychiatry department, actually, that, and well. and he was almost literally removed from his post because um, of his interest in UFOs and and uh, in particular experiencers of UFOs, uh, yeah. and uh, the president of Harvard was going to fire him, and one of the biggest funders for Harvard, uh, one of the biggest donors. Um, I think it was uh, one of the Rockefeller, the Rockefellers, um, who had an interest in UFOs as well, and called up the president of Harvard and said, "If you fire this guy, you'll get no more donors, no, no more donations from us." And so yeah, they didn't, yeah. they didn't fire him; they left him alone. But um, yeah, it's really a tragedy because he died before his time. He was hit hit by a car, I believe, in England. Yeah, you know, That's and true. and and, and, uh, and by the way, and by the way, um, his conclusion was the kids were uh, not deceptive. And it wasn't uh, uh, some kind of a form of mass hysteria mm -hmm. either. No. So that's very interesting. No, and it and it perfectly mimicked the experiences, um, maybe without the beings getting out, of the kids in Westall who saw very similar things um, and people who have had other experiences. Um, John Mack was just a real force for this. And I think we have to be really careful when we talk about hypnotic regressions um, because... Mm -hmm. It's very easy when someone is hypnotized uh, to re to realize something that they've experienced. Um, mm -hmm. For the interviewer, the, hyp the hypnotist's biases, beliefs, whatever, to transfer onto that person, you know, and and give yeah. them kind of false memories. Those kids were never hypnotized. You know, we should point that out. Like, you know, they were. He never put them under hypnosis or anything like that. He just went down there and interviewed them and found them to be credible witnesses, um, as did many other people as well um as so. did the teachers <laughs> eventually the teachers though um a eventually. lot of them did not speak out out of fear you know they they didn't want to be ridiculed they didn't want their school to become this you know place of uh a, the butt of a joke so um i think that a lot of them didn't 
come forward in the way that maybe they could have. And they actually, when James interviewed, excuse me, interviewed a few of them when he went back to Rua um, recently, you know, they, he spoke to one of the head, the headmistresses there who was one of the teachers there on site at that time, you know, she's now the headmistress. And, uh, and she said, you know, I really regret that I didn't do more, you know, and I didn't say anything. She said, he said, I was worried more about my own experience and my own um, issues that I was having at the time because of all of this. And so I didn't um, defend those kids the way that I should have, you know, and yeah. I think that's a common occurrence too. I think people tend to head for the hills when something is too weird to really wrap their heads around. Yeah. So, so I interviewed James, actually he was my very first UAP interview, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, uh, about six months ago. And, uh, it was published in, uh, in a Dutch magazine uh, called New Revue. Uh, but you know, I also uploaded it uh, on my podcast channel, but, uh, James, <clears throat> I was talking uh, to him about the phenomenon. He was al already in the making of the process, uh, of the documentary and then in 2017 while making this documentary the new york times dropped uh the uh pentagon article right now mm -hmm. now lance uh james said you know th this this was a game changer right he was mm -hmm. making this documentary and now the pentagon acknowledges mm -hmm. uap now were you there when that happened no, I wasn't working with James yet at that point. I was actually finishing Third Eye Spies at that point. And, and uh, there were actually people in Third Eye Spies that I had interviewed um, that were also mentioned in that article. And, right. and, uh, and it, you know, I found there to be a lot of crossover between, you know, the scientific study of consciousness and the scientific study of UAPs. And, and, uh, and so I actually included at the very end of Third Eye Spies, the, one of the very last kind of title cards um, is a shot of the uh, Go Fast or Gimbal or, you know, one of those videos from from uh, the New York Times. Um, right. And and uh, and sort of saying that, that, you know, like that these two sort of topics are are not unrelated. And so that was how that that article impacted me is it just it made me understand sort of the um, the the way that that it's just such a small community in a way but um it also really um gave a lot of people i think the courage to come forward you know the courage yeah. to talk more openly about the product the the uh the prospects of this yeah. because um you know it's it's hard to talk about it in mainstream circles if it's a fringe topic you know, I'm sure there are For plenty of sure. people in the world that would love this to stay a little tiny topic that is only on, you know, um, tiny little places and, and you know, and sounds really weird and crazy and and uh, and cuckoo because then nobody has to really address it. So, now, of course, now, of course, Mr. Elizondo was heavily involved with the, the, the New York Times release uh, sure. and and we were in San Marino with him. So let's. We'll talk about that a little bit later because he's a, a key player. Yeah, well, he is. I mean, I mean, uh, I think yeah. I mean, he he would probably be the first to say, no, no, it's it's not really me. It's it's a lot of people, and it is a lot of people. It's not just one person. I mean, that article went through hell to come out in 2017. You know, right. in order for for Lou to get that footage to Chris Mellon out of the Pentagon, you know, to have um, the. Uh, the New York Times actually take it seriously enough to write a real article on it and not just a, you know, kind of takedown of the topic, you know, right. Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, you know, who right. really put their careers on the line to, yeah. to get that information out. And, and um, this is a process that is not new. We see this exact same thing happening again and again and again through the history of this topic. It's never happened here in the States that way you know uh, well, in the new york well, lance Times. well lance thank god it's illegal now to put you on the burning stake <laughs> or me <laughs> it may not be i don't know i mean we, it depends on where you live around here uh, yeah, i don't know yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, you know it, it is it is true though that that i think some topics are the victim of dogma you know, it, this was a major theme of Third Eye Spies, if, you, if you've seen it, is, and I didn't I did. fully believe it 
when the people I was interviewing, in particular, the producer, Russell Targ, was telling me that the biggest problem that they faced at SRI with, with their um, study of ESP was religious and scientific dogma. And, okay, and so let, let's let's establish uh, third eye spies for just one second, so people sure. know what, what 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 we're talking about. Your your mm -hmm. documentary, of course. Sure. Um, so it's about remote viewing, uh, right? And uh, that that is basically uh, consciousness using your consciousness. Um, right. So it's, tell it's me that remote, tell, what what remote, remote viewing view. is is um, basically being able to see things using only your the power of your imagination and your mind that are outside of space and time so you can see events you can see people you can see places basically just by focusing on an identifier as to what you're being asked to look at um, so that it, could be a person an event an object uh, yes something like that and 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 what they found at sri was that believe it or not um, this is actually a very common ability that people have. Um, and in fact, it's probably the reason that you and I are here right now having this conversation. It's the reason why your grandfather was able to escape dangerous situations in World War II in his youth while someone else didn't. Right. Because, because everybody has a gut feeling. You know, everybody right. has an intuition. Instinct. You know, instinct. instinct. Yeah. You go left instead of right in front of the tree. You know, um, and you don't get eaten by the tiger, and maybe somebody else does. You know, it's it, because something told you to go a different way. Um, it's just part of being human. You know that that we have kind of a sixth sense, and we can intuit things. You know, and and really anyone that is successful at anything will tell you at some point in their lives they took a hunch. You know, they took a risk and they did something, and it worked out for them. You know, exactly. so um, I think that's where you have to start from in that. And, and it was very much about who we are as human beings and, and what we are capable of. And again, I went into it very skeptically. Um, I didn't know a lot about it. And um, I, after a couple of years of doing research, I mean, there's just an overwhelming amount of research out there. And uh, even in the film, we actually um, showed demonstrations of groups of people doing this kind of a technique. And, and basically the way it works is typically I will create like an identifier and it can be just a random number, you know, ABC one, two, three. And that signifies either a person or a place, you know, what's, what's going on there. And I'll just give you that blindly and say, tell me what you see at ABC one, two, three. And you don't know anything about it, you know, and you will go into a room, just close your eyes. And the first unexpected images that come to your mind, you write yeah. it down as crazy right. as it seems. You just write it down. You don't label it. You don't try to describe exactly what it is. Uh, yeah. You just draw and write exactly what it is that you see. And and what they found was time and time again, people would get what they were looking at correctly. Now, let's talk about consciousness a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So if I take my, my religion, I think our religion, actually, mm -hmm. uh, Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, there's Judy... Uh, 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 Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. Sure. And um, Jews do not believe in the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't disqualify it, mm -hmm. but they just say, we don't claim to know what happens mm -hmm. after we pass. Right. But one thing is for certain in Judaism, and that is energy does never uh, go. Mm -hmm. So if you take consciousness uh, and energy maybe, um, that that could be something we could we are still pioneering on uh, 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 using with our brains maybe or or mm -hmm. something like that you know so this is like new territory for humankind so this is very interesting to me it's actually not new territory though it's not um, you know well, twenty five yeah. hundred years ago um, Pat Manjani in the Yoga Sutras said um, you know along the path of your enlightenment. Um, you're going to encounter strange things. You may be able to see distant places and distant people and things that are out of time. Uh, you know, you may be able to levitate man, and, I, and move I, things I've in had, mind. I've had experience. <laughs> I've had experiences. Yeah, I'm, I'm highly receptive mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, and th th I have weird shit. Uh, I <laughs> there are some there are some individuals who are very dear to me. I can actually feel. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if they're distressed or mm -hmm. is, if they're, it, it, it's weird. Yeah. First, yeah. first, I thought, you know, my mind is playing tricks on me, but mm -hmm. it, I, I never had it wrong. Yeah. That's a, uh, you know, that is that, a, a documented, um, you know, sense, the sense of knowing when a loved one is, is dying or in trouble, you know, yeah. um, that, that is a, a very common thing. And, and, um, in fact, one of the things they ran into uh, in in RV with remote viewing is that the, the biggest danger in RV is that maybe the person tasking you with a with a target may know something about that target or have a pre-existing bias about it because it right. could lead to contamination through basically telepathy, you know, because because we're all on some level connected. You know, that's a that's a spiritual truth that goes back to the beginning of time. Again, you know, Kabbalah. It's, it's, Again, Kabbalah. Right, right. But it, it's not just the, a it's yeah. not just an esoteric term. There is actually scientific, very real evidence that shows that this is the case, that, that there is a quantum entanglement, if you want to call it that, um, that is almost like holographic in nature. Because right. because the only way that you could actually see something using only your mind that you would have no knowledge of whatsoever is if somehow you are connected to that other space, you know, yeah. you, you have to be connected. And so, so that to me um, is a really big argument that just says the world is not set up the way we think it is. You know, it, it is not set up the way they think it is. And in fact, oftentimes like this, like Eve here is saying, you know, the results shocked her when she did an RV session for the first time, what they find is there is a first timer effect and that usually, most people will get it right the first time and then the second time they'll fail and then it'll be harder for them thereafter because what happens is your conscious brain starts to kick in and tell yeah. you this is not possible. And, right. and, and this is something that you see again and again and again, you know, going back to Columbus, showing up on the shores of, of, of the new world. And I and use that. The, I, yeah. yeah the, 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 the people there literally couldn't see the ship. You know, they didn't want to accept the fact that something there was there that they didn't understand in their reality. This is the way that our human brains work. And it's the same thing with the phenomenon, you know, and with, yeah. uh, you know, UAPs. It's, it's something outside of our ability to understand. And so usually it's the, the shamans, you know, and, and the magicians and the people who, who are more kind of tuned in to their inner selves that are able to see something new first you know yeah. um but it doesn't change the fact that there's a scientific basis for this stuff you know and and that it's simply that disciplines within science don't communicate that is the biggest issue whether it's uaps or consciousness or climate change or you name it the the biggest issue and the hurdle we have to overcome is that we don't communicate enough between disciplines. Everybody con concentrates on just this one little thing that they're doing and they have no idea what the other research is that's going on. And that has to wow. change for us to survive as a species. Yeah, that, that that's incredibly interesting. You know, what, what I love about w w what you are uh, so in uh, so much into investigating, mm -hmm. um, if you look at Kabbalah, you know, there's the tree of life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the symbol basically of, of um, of Kabbalah and um, you know you see what's above ground you see the tree and the branches mm -hmm. and you you know it, it's it's right in front of you mm -hmm. but what is holding the tree up mm -hmm. it's what's underground sure it's what, it's what you cannot see yes it's the, and, it's, and it's, it's it's the roots and and all of those roots have a certain skill or task or meaning mm -hmm. and you know there's so much we can see what is still a huge part of our consciousness yeah what we are and uh you know i i i i, I can't stop listening to you uh, dude just <laughs> go go <laughs> go on so i, I spend way too much time thinking about this stuff you know and and, yeah. and, it, and it can only come you know th this kind of train of thought th that we're talking about um is not something that you can tell someone else about it's just like with with remote viewing. Like you, I can tell you all day long that that you know, hey, people can see things with their mind, and it's really cool, man. You know, but but you know what? That doesn't change your worldview or your opinion. You know, you, you, the only way for you to change your own worldview is to have experience, and and you know, you, you experience the world in your own unique way. Everybody does, and and 
those experiences shape who we are. And when they would do remote viewings at SRI um, during the Cold War, constantly they were under threat of being um, canceled, their program being canceled, because they were being right. funded by the government for 20 years, you know, every year. Yeah. And yeah, so, so, so there, there, there's one film I saw uh, a couple of years ago, I think, and it was Men Staring at Goats. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the same it's not, thing. No, it's, no, it's no. Not it's thing. not anything like that. They, they made that whole thing into a satire. And, yeah. and I'm not saying there weren't like crazy people, you know, like I think it was actually based on some real people. Um, but um, it was, it, it, it's, it's, it was um, really a bastardization of what, what was done um, and the serious work that was done and, uh, and the real accomplishments that were made using that, that technique, you know, in remote viewing. I mean, they, they literally, um, you know, they rescued hostages that nobody else could find. They got intel on, um, on um, military installations and you know vehicles and things sure. that no one else could get. They were yeah, literally. Let's let's, let's let's talk about your film. Yeah. Let's talk about Third Eye Spies. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, you had some very very compelling uh, cases in that film. Mm -hmm. what, which one stood out the most to you? Oh, the bomber. The bomber. The the, the bomber. I mean. Um, I actually got to meet Jimmy Carter and, and uh, we, we were able to just meet him briefly and uh, Russell was able to reintroduce himself and he, we didn't talk much, but we found um, recordings of Jimmy Carter talking about this experience um, that he had had while president. Um, apparently the Russians had a new nuclear capable bomber that was a, a top secret and one of the pilots decided he wanted to defect. And so right. he flew his bomber over the Congo and ejected and, right. and, uh, and, and surrendered himself. And his bomber was lost in the canopy of the jungle in the, in the, in the Congo. No satellite imagery could pick it up. The KGB was desperately trying to find this bomber before the Americans did. And the CIA wanted it also very badly. So right. uh, SRI was called up and and uh, you know and and tasked by defense intelligence agency, tell us where this bomber is. And um, they tasked two people who have never come forward um, on this, and um, both of them wound up giving maps of of the region. You know, um, they didn't know that's what they're doing. They're drawing like squiggly lines and looks like maybe a river here and a rock here and whatever. And um, and one of them literally went out to this to the area where they had the command center where they're looking for this bomber and put a pin in a map and said this is where it will be, right? And and they went and looked there, and they literally found natives coming out of the jungle carrying airplane parts, right? And that and they found this bomber and and uh, Carter later came out and said, you know, um, we couldn't find this bomber. We had no way of finding it the director of the CIA came in and told me that we knew these people out in California that might be able to find it. Um, they were using remote viewing. And, um, and all I know is that they told us where to look and it was there, you know? And, and so literally the president of the United States confirmed that, that this happened. And, and really there's a whole story around that because as a result of that, many of the people that were in that program believe that that is when their funding was truly pulled like the whole program went downhill because Carter said that publicly and, and he himself as a president didn't know he was dealing with classified information. And, and yeah. so, um, you know, he said this at a, a Emory university, he goes to Emory college every year in Georgia to give a speech to the graduating class. And he, and, and a CNN reporter asked him a question and that's how he answered. He talked about this bomber. They asked him, what's the weirdest thing you ever saw? And that's what he said. And he didn't know he was outing a top secret program that was still going underway. Yeah, and, yeah. and so shortly after that, the whole thing just <laughs> shut down and that was the end. So, so it's like, you know, they, they kind of blamed Carter for that, you know, it, <laughs> poor Jimmy. Yeah, really. You know, uh, he, he didn't know he was, he was doing something and it, it called a lot of public attention to the program and, and they were under pressure and um, had kind of been on the way out for a while. And then that was the end of it. So are they wow. still doing it? You know, it, you'd think it was a useful tool. If you talk to a lot of these guys, you would think they would, but um, you know, that's officially not something they're doing.
Now, Lens, let's talk about this consciousness uh, thing a little bit, because I know for a fact uh, Mr. Robert Bigelow uh, has put a lot of effort in, uh, you know, hiring huge scientists to investigate uh, consciousness, mainly to see if their uh, if consciousness is going to cease or stay after. Yes, yeah, I know he did a big essay contest just recently where the prize was was quite huge for people who uh, who could demonstrate uh, survival after death. And um, yeah. it's just like you were saying in the Kabbalah, you know, energy cannot be destroyed. Like once it exists, it exists. And exactly. um, what the sort of remote viewing program kind of demonstrated was that that very thing that that consciousness does not fully reside in here you know it, it can't because um statistically all of the work that they've done there's so much data that there's something to it so there's something going on and they've shown definitively that it is not a signal that is physically traveling from your brain somewhere else they do experiments in faraday cages they've done experiments on the bottom of an ocean in a submarine to see if there's any signal degradation there is no limit that they have found to this ability. Literally, um, a man named Ingo Swan, who was part of that program, was able to tell you what time the sun was rising on Jupiter, you know, on, wow. on um, you know, like uh, yeah. as if he was standing on Jupiter, you know, yeah. so, so there's no degradation of signal, no matter how far away you are. It, it very, really is, very really sad story, by the way, Ingo. Yeah. Uh, a sad story, did you say? Yeah, the, the, the what happened to Ingo, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he uh, um, you know, he wound up kind of uh, more of a recluse, I think, at the end of his life. But um, but he also was a brilliant researcher himself. You know, he was a, yeah. a professional psychic, and he's actually the reason why the remote viewing program was started at SRI. Because um, prior to Ingo, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, who had founded that program, were basically just doing card tricks and things like if you ever saw the opening of ghostbusters and bill murray has got these cards one has a star and the other one has some squiggly lines on it and he's asking people you know what do you which card do you see and he'll say like i see a star and then he shocks them you know without the shocks those are called gonsfeld experiments and that was primarily what they were doing and what they found is that the human brain um there's a decline effect people get bored and and if they're asked to do the same tasks over and over again the results go way down and Ingo Swan, who was one of their first sort of subjects, said, look, man, if you want to know what's in the envelope or what's on the other side of the car, just turn it over. You know, you don't you don't have to have me to do that. I can literally see anywhere in the world. Give me something better to look at. And and he was so annoying and such a pest about it. And that that literally they started to humor him on coffee breaks and they would send somebody to go get coffee and or whatever. And then ask Ingo to describe where the guy was. And he kept getting accurate descriptions of where the guy was over and over again. Yeah, that's and that's awesome. what started the program. That's yeah. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Um, so let's talk San Marino a little bit because, sure. uh, you know, the both of us were there. Um, I feel <clears throat> we were part of history in the making. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you experience it? Because we were both, you were following Lou. I'm right. not sure if you can maybe give us a little bit of a tip of the iceberg on what you were doing with Mr. Elizondo. Well, I mean, there. it was very informal. I mean, I, I have a lot of mutual friends with Lou and, um, you know, just recently became friends with him as well. And and um, I was basically, I had the opportunity to go to Italy and, um, you know, it's not for a specific project or anything like that. It was just more of an informal kind of a thing to... Um, just kind of investigate what's going on in this subject. I mean, I have thought about doing documentaries on the UFO subject. It's been kind of a logical progression from the stuff that I did with consciousness studies. And I feel right. like there's a real connection between the two things. I mean, I feel like you can't really look at UAPs and that phenomenon, again, as its own discipline and its own field. It's not. It's connected to all of these other disciplines. So, so I've been actively kind of exploring that in a lot of ways. Uh, recently and kind of looking for a next project in terms of like what I can do on a documentary level. Um, so that's really kind of like why I, I showed up, you know, at, at that conference was because I just really felt like this was something that 
Um, I think what Lou is doing in particular is important work. You know, it's yeah. important work. And there, and as was all of the other people that were there at that conference, um, you know, they're trying to get the word out about this subject in a way that is real. You know, this isn't like them playing around, like coming up with ideas, you know, um, or pretending they know all the answers. This, these are like real scientists. You know, there was a guy, there were, there were people there from all over the world that. that yeah, let's elaborate a little bit. Let's elaborate a little bit on the on the ensemble we encountered over there. Uh, so we had uh, a lot of people of uh, ICER, of course. Uh, um, sure. Uh, Mr. Gary Hesseltine. Uh, mm -hmm. We we saw some uh, very high profile Italian uh, people. There was a lot of high profile no. Italian people that I probably shouldn't mention. But yeah, I know. But no, it, it, <laughs> I know. it is. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, true that there are a lot of. I think serious minded people that are very interested in the subject. And again, yeah. I think it goes back to 2017 and it goes back to something breaking through the ice with that yeah. New York times article, which then unleashes a bevy of other information like the phenomenon, the movie, which, which kind of makes you go, Oh, wait a minute. This is something that has been studied and seen consistently for many, 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 many years. And Definitely. so we need to take this seriously. And I, and I think it's great that there are actually now real scientists taking this seriously. And, you know, not at this conference, but um, when I was doing conferences for the remote viewing film, I would literally be shooting the stage and then I would turn the camera around and try to get a shot of the audience. And, and literally right. somebody from the back would come running up to me and go, please don't shoot the audience. You know, the, the people here don't want to be seen being here. You know, right. and, and, it, and it made me realize very quickly how sensitive the very serious people who are interested in this stuff are about being associated with the topic. And now so I can think I, I, I do think I can say this. Uh, there was a certain film crew uh, connected to a certain individual individual. And I can I think we can say this mm -hmm. because they were filming Lou. Uh -huh. And that was the personal. Oh, right. Uh, right. Yeah, that right. was the mm -hmm. personal, um, I think, television uh, network of Mr. Berlusconi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, Lou has gotten some really good press. Um, yeah. But it's not about the press. I think for him, you know, just just from the time that that he and I have been friends, um, I think that it's more about just moving the ball forward. And it's not about him. If he gets to be the spokesperson for something, great. I don't think he really cares. As a matter of fact, I think he'd rather not be the spokesperson. But I, I think that it is important for serious-minded people to step forward, like Lou. You know, like he he took, I think, a big risk in in coming forward about this topic. And I think yeah, there's I a think lot of other people who are kind of in the shadows and going, "Yay, team!" You know, kind of go, but but they're yeah. not willing to be on camera right now. Yeah, but I I, I do think uh, Mr. Elizondo's work is is damn near biblical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he uh, the, he's the one sticking out his neck. Uh, they're not claiming knowing what it is, but showing us there is something, right? Well, there's there's uh, there's there's a lot of um, as I've said many times. I mean, there's a lot of BS in the world, and yeah. and and a lot of pretenders. And you can say whatever you want about Lou Alexando, but you cannot, I think, claim that he is a pretender, you know, and, and I think he gets no. a lot of flack on social media and places like that from people who say, oh, he's he's faking or he's making something up and whatever. Dude, he's not making guy, money. He's, yeah. he's, he's not being paid, number one, but he's also yeah. here's the guy who literally um, has been at war you know, who, who, who is a veteran who knows what it's like, you know, to be in a war situation. And, and I commend anybody. I have a lot of friends who, who spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and places like that. Um, I come from a long family line of, of people who have given military service. And, you know, wow. when, when you're someone who has been on that level of chaos, then something like UFOs and your reputation and um, and what's best for your career and all of those kinds of things, they're not as important, I don't think. And and yeah. that's how I think that man strikes me is that is that it's not as important what people think of him. It's more about, look, here's something that we're not looking at in the serious light that we need to be looking at it as. 
So, yeah. so, you know, I have a lot of respect for, for Lou in that situation because, um, and that's kind of like why I, I just thought it would be fun to, to, to catch him at this conference, because I think that there is um, gravitas and weight to some people on this subject. And, and if they're putting themselves on the line, then they deserve the respect to be treated fairly and to be documented and, and to, and to be, you know, um, seriously considered, you know, and, and um, I've, you know, I find few people like that. And, and when we do meet people like that, I think they need to be, you know, cared for and defended, you know, publicly. Definitely, definitely. And mm -hmm. thank God that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, uh, former Senator Harry Reid and uh, yeah. Christopher Mellon. It, you uh, know, if you, ask, if you ask me, hypothetically, I don't know this, I'm just speaking totally well, as a lay person who has spent enough time talking to people who are in intelligence, um, mm -hmm. mostly on, on the remote viewing side, mm -hmm. um, that we tend to look at government as monolithic as it's one thing. It's like, there's a guy in the background twisting his mustache and going, okay, today we're going to show them this little tid tidbit and we're going to manipulate everybody to do this. That's not the way the government works, you know, especially intelligence communities. It is highly, highly, highly segmented. They call it stove piping. And, right. and as a result, the left hand hardly ever knows what the right hand is doing. And um, there's a lot of um, plausible deniability, you know, and, right. and, um, my opinion is that there are forces within government, just like when it came to remote viewing, now on the UAP side, who um, are almost in a civil war, you know, and, yeah. and I think it's apparent, you know, that, that on the one side, you have officials in government, former officials in government, you, you know, who really want transparency on this issue of UAPs. And then on the other side, you have people who just like the status quo. Now, maybe that's because they have the fusion reactor in their basement and they're already, you know, pumping stuff out. I don't know. But, but, but yeah. maybe it's also just simply because, and I think this is the more likely reason, they just don't want to rock the boat. Nobody right. wants to rock the boat. Middle management does not ever like to rock, rock the boat. It's the guy at the top yeah. that gets paid to rock the boat. Anybody else is paid to say no. And, and not only to say no, but to just preserve the, the placid image that they have and and um, I think that that's what Luis Elizondo has encountered over and over again. He's he's almost been discredited, you know, by people saying, "Oh no, he didn't do anything." And then it literally took a letter from Harry Reid saying, "You know, actually, he did do something," and that was impressive. Yeah. And that was also impressive on Harry Reid's part. I mean, I think Harry Reid deserves a tremendous amount of credit on this Alliance. subject. I mean, he spoke to us um, and and basically turned us on. Uh, really James Fox onto um, the whole nuclear issue of, of these launch officers over years, not being able to launch missiles because unknown craft would fly over their silos and turn the missiles off, which was yeah, technically yeah, yeah. impossible. So, I mean, that came yeah, from, so, that came from um, Harry Reid. Yeah. So I was able to, to do an interview with uh, Mr. Harry Reid uh, a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the perfect moment because a couple of days before that, uh, Barack Obama actually disclosed mm -hmm. on James Corden, mm -hmm. a comedian, that. Yeah. Yeah, that he knows about UAP. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was mind blowing to me. And if Barack Obama knows about damn UAP mm -hmm. um, and Harry Reid is the one who actually helped him in power, helped Bill Clinton in power. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Clinton actually uh, told uh, on, on, on live television, he knows about UAP. Yeah, but they know about it. They know about it at a very, very minimal level. You know, um, I, I mean, people think yeah. that the buck stops with the, the president. The president is just a visitor to the White House, you know, and, right. and if there's not a need to know, uh, this sounds cliched, but, you know, that that phrase, need, do you need to know? You know, um, I mean, imagine if Trump knew all about you know, UAPs. I mean, it would, you know, can he, oh, keep it no. you know, it's like, I mean, maybe, <laughs> and maybe he does. I don't know. But, but I mean, um, you know, Gordon Cooper um, spent time briefing um, some of Clinton's cabinet and, and they looked for documents that Gordon Cooper, who was the fan, the uh, Apollo astronaut had had sightings both in the air force and, and uh, also as an astronaut. And, um, and he actually had filmed a UFO landing at Edwards Air Force Base and sent this footage 
to his superiors and never saw it again. And right. and uh, Harry Reid has looked for this footage. Gordon Cooper um, tried to get the footage, and they went to the Pentagon and other places to try to find the footage, and they were just blocked. Basically, you know, this stuff doesn't exist. We don't know anything about it. The end. Look, Lance and Harry Reid wanted to visit Lockheed Martin and was denied access. Right, because well, he had no reason to do move. It. Yeah. yeah, he's a, he's a, a politician, ball. and politicians say stuff. Politicians will use information for their own benefit. And and so, you, you know, it's a, but the danger is that something is such a closely guarded secret that the information is literally lost forever. You know, and right. and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I made Third Eye Spies was because those guys were getting older and some of them were passing away. And, and this is information that they'd spent 50 years, you know, building up and, and that nobody knew about you know, in terms of like what consciousness is capable of. And and I think that probably the same thing has happened repeatedly in the UFO field because you had Blue Book, they'd gather up a bunch of information, they shut down, what happens to all of that information? It goes nowhere, you know, um, and there's cobwebs on it and nobody sees it again. And so we start anew over and over again. We're constantly starting over with these types of um, issues, you know, because they're incredible enough that they never break through the mainstream. But I think right. that's where Luis Elizondo deserves credit, as does Christopher Mellon and other people around them um, that that have come from higher up in government enough that they were able to break through the ice. And, mm -hmm. and that can't be understated, the importance of that. You know, and so now it's all about building momentum, you know, and keeping the momentum going and, and just continuing to be honest about searching for the truth. Yeah, you know, and, and because, you know what, you know what, you're you're part of that, right? You're part of that momentum. You know, you're covering it. You're making art about it. You're making documentaries about well, it. Well, so are right? you. So are you. You know, so are you. We both are. And and the, you know, the our our modern age is a double edged sword. You know, because right now it doesn't take much to be a part of it. You know, it doesn't take much to really do anything in media. It just it takes balls. It well, it does. It does. But I, what I mean is that, that <laughs> the medium is there. The medium yeah. of YouTube, the medium of Twitter, the medium of whatever is there. But what you do with it is really the issue. You know, it, it's like I went to film school, you know, and I came from yeah. a little small farm town, you know, hardly ever picked up a camera, you know, a video camera, could never even get one. And when I came to film school, it was like a revelation because now I had access to all of this equipment and people who right. are interested. But very quickly, I figured out one thing. Most of those people weren't taking advantage of what they had in front of them. They were just there because they wanted to party or get out of math class or, or, or whatever. But there was a small group of people who were always down in the basement editing, always down there working, constantly trying to create art. And, and I found myself to be in that group of people. I want, I was there for a really specific reason to, to become a filmmaker. That's what I wanted to do. And, yeah. and, uh, and I knew that if I didn't do it, I was going to wind up working in the fields back home and I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I was highly motivated to get out of central California and, and to create yeah. art, you know, and, and, um, and regardless of talent, it has always been the people who were the most passionate about what they were doing that succeed. You can be yeah. less talented, but more passionate and still succeed really well, you know, and you have this medium now of the internet where you can literally travel anywhere, talk to anyone. You know, you can be in the Netherlands and I can be in Los Angeles and we can talk, you know, but on the flip side, that's very dangerous because you can also know absolutely nothing, be a complete idiot, say stupid things and, and gain yeah, millions of followers and then and then become an authority just because you have millions of followers. So so it's the it's the combination of integrity and access, you know, I do think. I do think that, that there's a weird, <clears throat> how do you call this? Um, I, I do think it, it, in a weird way, is meant to be what the hell we are doing. For me, exa uh, for example, when I was a kid, I have ADD, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think in images. Mm -hmm. I don't think in words. I see things and mm -hmm. I hear things. And it. I have direct uh, associations with something happening i see a man running there's a story mm -hmm. you know that, that that's the way i work it was the way i'm programmed even as a kid i would 
express myself by making comics right so mm -hmm. so i would make like a, a little how do you call it uh, you know like a like a comic thing sure sure and, and basically you're already making your own story scenes about things that are happening in your life and you're mm -hmm. actually processing it in that way this is what i made my occupation of you know this is mm -hmm. what i'm still doing mm -hmm. uh so whatever is coming at me which has an impression on me i just have get an I, i'm on me i get obsessed with mm -hmm. it right so i want to know i want to know more and I, I i go into it and i think it's guys like you and me that um for some reason are not uh you know uh we don't have a problem with with whatever the the general public thinks about us or what we are doing no we just go for what is instinctively right yeah uh, yeah yeah it's a it's a um it's a combination uh, you know i've spent i've spent a lot way too long you know too many years you know um trying to do you know or doing i should say you know um film stuff and um it's a delicate balance because uh, when I was young, I thought of filmmaking as strictly an art form. You know, it's an art form. I'm making right. art. You know, this is, I'm an auteur. Let me make my film, you know, the way I want to make it, you know, and, and what I've learned over the years is that it is also a business, you know, that you, you do have to create something that other people want to see, you know, and because you have to because, make a living, you have to make money. Yes. Yeah. You have to make a living. You know, I mean, I, I also work, I work as an editor. I work as a cinematographer. I work as a director, you know, and, and a producer, but, but it's a, um, at the end of the day, uh, you won't be able to make a living doing something that you absolutely hate doing or that is false, you know, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, most of the time you're going to bring yourself out. You're not going to want to do it anymore. Or you're going to go into real estate or something, you know, it, yeah. it, you know, it's the, the things that keep you going are, I see what are, you did there. Yeah. They are, they are, they are, oh, why? I no, no. I, I don't know what I did, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it is um, so important that you are objective about your art, you know, and, and what you want to do because, you you have to be thinking of it like chess, not checkers. It's like, how do I get across the finish line and then get an audience to see this film? There's a million people on YouTube who pick up a nice camera and then like run tests and shoot little things here and there and whatever, but they don't tell stories. They don't turn it into something more, you know, and and there are other people who who do. And 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 it's the it's the sort of the long game, you know, as to how do you actually you know survive, make art you know, uh, create meaning in your own life and as well as other people's lives, you know, cause I mean, that's really what I love is, is, you know, can I create something that will affect you in some way? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're making a big impact, man. You know, the, 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 the things you are involved in, the things you are creating are absolutely mind blowing. Amazing. Thank you. And my hats off to you, sir. Thank you. So, um, you know, I can't wait for what's about to come. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit about new stuff from Lance Murgia. Um, well, I mean, I'm 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 working on. Um, you know, I'm part of like why I was in Italy. It's like I'm I'm exploring uh, where to go next as a as a documentary filmmaker. You know, yeah. um, you know, and and it will probably have something to do with the UFO field just because that's been kind of the logical progression as to where I've gone, it'll probably be about both of the things that, that are interesting to me right now. One of which is the UAP field and the other, which is consciousness, you know, and, and the, the connection there, you know, um, which I think is important. Um, you know, to me, the, the issues that we're facing are not um, segmented, you know, like there's, there's really big issues and unless we, kind of realize sort of a a more holistic and holographic view of reality that that we are all kind of connected in a certain way um and and what happens to you affects me and vice versa um i think that we're gonna have a really tar hard time surviving as a species even another hundred years you know it's like there, there needs to be a sense of empathy in in what we do 
as both filmmakers and as a species in order for us to survive. It's like people need to like just become more aware of what is around them and the people that are around them. And, and unfortunately, we've seen this decline into tribal camps here in the United States over the last several years. And, and that just needs to change worldwide, you know, because we have big issues we need to solve. And so I'm looking for ways to tie all of these disparate threads together in, in my work. Um, but the other thing that I'm really doing is I've moved into um, what's called virtual production. You know, as right. you can see, my, my studio back here is a mess. I still have a lot of my stuff that I brought back from Italy, you know, sitting behind me here. But um, mm. but this is kind of like my playroom where um, I can uh, create real time virtual films, you know, basically that are photorealistic using very high end computers. Um, and I can tell stories that are unimpeded by by the need to ask permission of someone else, you know, because mm. to me, that really is what I've been striving towards for a long, long time is to be able to make films on my own terms, to have all of my my own gear, to be able to um, to make animated films even, you know, are now within the realm of possibility for me as a as an independent filmmaker that would have been impossible even two years ago because the technology didn't exist. It's so new. And I am kind of a technology geek. I just, I love new technology. So this is something that, you know, I'm working on. So. So yeah. what am I doing specifically? Um, I can't say, but um, I do know that it will just be talking about the human condition and and sort of our place in the universe. Yep. So uh, Lance, I want to give the uh, viewers an op opportunity to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so guys, if you want to ask Lance a question, uh, I, I let's say five to 10 minutes, I'll uh, let you go and uh, please use the super chat. Uh, so if you want to ask Lance a question, uh, please go uh, ahead and, and do that. Uh, and Lance uh, and me, we, uh, you know, we're, we're looking to collaborate a little bit. On yeah. Something. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I really am glad that we met, man. I mean, it's like you, you are a very, very unique individual and, and it was a lot of fun meeting you, you know, in, in Italy and, and oh, um, likewise, and I, man. I do think that, that we certainly can find um, some cool stuff to get into. You know, it's like, I mean, you, your, your, your background and your story is, is very interesting and um, <laughs> you know, it would be great to collaborate, you know, and yeah, it would be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So guys, uh, I don't see any questions. Um, that means I'm gonna, you know, say goodbye to you guys. Lance, hang around a little bit. We need to talk. Okay. <laughs> I hope I hope it was okay. I hope I didn't talk too much, everybody. Thank you if you've stuck around this yeah. long. <laughs> no, that's look, you're here to talk a lot. So uh, yeah. Uh, but by I, the way, I I, re I appreciate anybody who's who stayed this long and um, definitely check out. Third Eye Spies, it's free on YouTube now. You can see it. Um, it's gotten over a million views just in the last uh, couple of months. And um, the phenomenon is still available on um, on um, iTunes. And I think soon we'll have some sort of a streaming release other places. Uh, you can go to my YouTube page, which is just Lance Mangia, my name. Um, and um, you can see clips that were not included in Third Eye Spies and a bunch of other random stuff um, from over the years. Um, you know, so I'm on YouTube. Please check me out. And, um, thank you for having me, Max. It's fine. Dude, dude, you're, uh, I, I, I have a feeling we're going to be friends for life. I have a feeling definitely. we're going to do, we're going to do some stuff mm -hmm. and, uh, you're definitely going to be back. So guys, uh, thank you for, uh, watching and, uh, you know, I think this might be in my top five favorite interviews. Oh, so, wonderful. And the next time I'll make it to number one. <laughs> <laughs> you might you don't you don't even know if you're number one. I'm yeah. not gonna tell. You know, your ego is gonna just yeah. blow up. Uh, <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> All right. Guys, thank you for watching. Lance, stick around, dude. Okay. Boom. <laughs>